Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out tonight on a drizzly night. I'd like to blame that on the low attendance. Uh, <clears throat> we wanted this, this room because it only holds, it holds uh, 997 people. And I'm afraid we didn't have enough room, but I guess we do. I do appreciate all of you good folks coming out tonight. And if you don't know, the bathrooms are down back in the foyer. And uh, we are going to be taking a break, and we'll uh, give you an opportunity to have some snacks up in the hall. And there are some uh, local businesses who have come tonight to share with you some of the eco-friendly products that they market. And you'll have a chance to take a look at those during that break and then after the uh, presentations are all done. My name is Jeff Barnum. I'm the Great Bay Piscataqua Waterkeeper. I have a long title. And I work for the Conservation Law Foundation. And I've been doing this job for a couple of three years now. And one of my biggest responsibilities or interests have, have, is really the nutrient pollution that all of us have a, that all of us are partly responsible for when it comes to our local waters. The, my focus, even though the Waterkeeper Alliance is a worldwide alliance and there may be 250 waterkeepers around the world, each one is focused on one particular body of water. And my role is to pay attention, very close attention, to that water quality. And hopefully at the end of my tenure to actually have improved that water quality. And that's the direction that we're moving. The, the clicker is not working yet, but it will show me, I'm sure. There it is. So, this is Great Bay. Can everyone see adequately, or do we need to dim some lights in the back of the door? Can everyone see all right? I think you can, probably. Great Bay is a rather large estuary. It's the only estuary uh, of this size you know, in this part of New England. And an estuary is fed by, in this case, several rivers, actually seven, and then has one exit, you know, down the Scatico River, down to the ocean of Newcastle. And what we've found over time, just so you know, we're in Exeter, down, or rather up the Squamscot River. And then, of course, you have the lamprey, the oyster, rather the oyster here, the lamprey, the Bellamy River. The Scatico main stem right there is made up of the uh, Kachiko and the Salmon Falls. And of course the Piscataqua runs down to the mouth. It's the bottom of the watershed for 52 towns, a large number of towns. 42 of them in, the, in New Hampshire and 10 are in Maine. It's 400,000 people. The ecosystem is driven by this. It doesn't look very exciting. It's eelgrass. Eelgrass is not marsh grass. It's not the marsh grass you see along an estuary. It is underneath the water. It's a flowering plant. And it grows anywhere from just below subtitle to maybe 15 or 16 feet deep. And the reason I'm interested in eelgrass is that it's been disappearing. In the late 90s, we had 2,600 acres of it, and we're down to about 16 or 1,700 acres now. And I'll get to the why in a minute. Much of the eelgrass that we have left looks like this. You can see that it has nuisance seaweeds and algae that's growing in amongst it and actually suffocating these eelgrass beds. Now, the eelgrass, because it's a flowering plant, it produces a great deal of oxygen. It's vital to the oxygen levels in the estuary. It's where everything lives. It's where the fin fish live, it's where the lobsters live, it's where the crabs live. And that's why we're concerned about losing so much of it. When we lose your grass, we end up with a great deal more sedimentation and suspension. When that happens, it affects photosynthesis, which further affects the growth of eelgrass. We also get this sea lettuce that we're starting to see growing in large, expansive acreages along the shore of Great Bay. This was just north of the Discovery Center last year. 
and uh, I'm amazed at how quickly this is starting to uh, impede on the flats and sea lettuce grows under high nitrogen conditions. And this you can see is a macroalgae growth in the Winnicott River and it's all about excessive nutrients. Now, this map is very similar to that first geographic map you saw, but if you look at just the cross-hatching areas here, all along the shores and all along the main stem of the river, these were the eelgrass beds which have disappeared since 1996. If you were at Adams Point here in Durham, you'd be hard pressed to find any eelgrass left in the little bay or up a little bay of the Scatico River all the way down to the shipyard. It's absolutely gone and replaced just with basically a mud flat. The eelgrass that we have left is this light green down in Great Bay proper. Again, here's an exeter up here. And that eelgrass, as I showed you, is diminished in quality and quantity. And just so you know, if you look something that is indirectly connected, and you should know it, you see the large yellow areas up here in the Oyster River, up here in the main stem, up here in the Bellamine, down in here. Oh, those were the historical oyster beds. We used to have 1,100 acres of oyster beds in Great Bay around 1993. Today, out of those 1,100 acres, all we have left is 50 acres. And you'll see that in these red areas here, off of Nanny's Island, here off of uh, Jackson Labs, up here in the Oyster. 50 acres out of 1,100 acres in a very short period of time. So where do the excessive nitrogen, where do the excessive nutrients come from? Now, you see this piece of the pie that's missing? Obviously you can't see it if it's missing, but you can see this third of the pie right here. This third of the pie, which is almost 400 tons, is nitrogen that's been coming from sewage treatment plants. In the Great Bay, in the Great Bay watershed, there were 18 sewage treatment plants. Some of them are a lot larger than others. And it's only been recently, in the last year, that we've seen some real significant progress on wastewater treatment plants. A lot of money is being spent in a lot of different places, including Exeter, to build new wastewater treatment plants under the direction of the EPA with new permits to dramatically reduce nitrogen. Exeter is going to have a new plant by the end of 2018. New market is building today. They'll have to be done by the 2017. Durham is doing well. Newington is upgrading. Newington, I mean Kittery is upgrading. Dover and Rochester, both large communities, have already made dramatic cuts in the nitrogen that's coming into the estuary. And Portsmouth is now on a schedule to build a new plant that will also denitrify at Pierce Island by 2020. So on the wastewater treatment plant front, this is great news. We're going to see some real reductions in the tonnage coming out of those sewage plants. But the piece of the pie that's left is really two-thirds of the total. And when you take that two-thirds and you take it over here to see it as a whole, this is where the nitrogen is coming from. And nitrogen, it's the weight of evidence that the EPA uses to say, this particular wastewater treatment plan has to be reduced by X amount. That weight of evidence, not everyone agrees that the issue is nitrogen, sort of like climate change and climate change deniers. But the bulk of the evidence, the weight of the evidence, is that nitrogen is the issue in salt water. So where does it come from? Well, this is 27% piece that comes from single-family home sewage, uh, sewage treatment, your septic tank and your field. They were never intended, they were never engineered to decrease nitrogen. So they are an issue. But I look at this pie and I say, well, where are, where's the low-hanging fruit? 
What is it that you and I can actually do to augment the progress being made by wastewater treatment facilities in reducing nitrogen? And it, it's certainly with animal waste, we can do a better job with pet waste. I doubt that we're going to see much change over here on atmospheric deposition. You know, some of this is you and I driving here tonight. The bigger chunk of it right here, that's actually nitrogen that's coming to us, coming out of the air, out of the rain and the snow, from upwind. It's uh, coal-fired electric generation plants in the Ohio River Valley, for example. Some change there, but it's happening slowly. The low-hanging fruit is this piece right here. It's the chemical fertilizer piece. We're talking somewhere between 200 and 260 tons. It's a huge amount. And what we know is that not a lot of this nitrogen is coming from agriculture. It's not coming from the farm down the road. It's also not coming, generally speaking, from golf courses, though it may locally. All of it, not all of it, but most of it is coming from your front yard, my front yard, your backyard, my backyard. It's the athletic fields at the high school. It's uh, any place that we have turf, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, people are using nitrogen fertilizers in the wrong way. And they're not doing the work that they need to do, that we all need to do, to make sure that we're not putting it down unnecessarily, or we're putting down the wrong type. You don't need to, this is a, here's an example. I hope no one in this room happens to live at this residence. <laughs> it's on Great Bay. It's, it's a residence that stripped the entire buffer area off between the lawn and Great Bay itself. Not only was it illegal, but you can clearly see that the grass is fairly uh, similar throughout. It's obviously being fertilized throughout, and they shouldn't be doing that. And here's an example of sort of the same thing. You know, there's uh, obviously whoever fertilized this to get this color green grass is fertilizing the whole thing. And it's just going right into the ditch. It's going directly into the Winnicott River. It's going directly into Great Bay. So, that is my spiel. That puts in perspective why I get excited about nutrient pollution in Great Bay. This is a resource. Great Bay, by the way, is in the National Estuary, Estuary Program. There are only 28 estuaries in this country that are in that program. It is also an estuary of national significance. And if we're not the ones, all of us, if we're not the ones to take action to go after this non-point nutrient pollution, then who's going to do it for us? No one is. It's up to us to do that. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to Kristen Murphy. Kristen is in the planning department, natural resources planner for the town of Exeter, and she's been working uh, with a group over the last year at least, and she's got a few words she wants to say before we move on to our other speakers. So, thank you, Jeff. Hello, everyone. As Jeff said, I'm Kristen Murphy. I'm the Natural Resource Planner for the Town of Exeter. And I'm not here to talk about specifically my work alone. Um, what I want to do is highlight a committee that we have in town. So the town of Exeter has a local committee of very dedicated volunteers that came together. It was essentially born out of a grassroots initiative concerned residents who all had an interest in improving water quality in town. They got together and knew about, so the slide Jeff showed, um, the slide Jeff showed with the pie graphs, they, um, is something that came out of a prep report, the Piscataqua Region's Estuaries Partnership. What they did is looked at all the non-point source pollution and they broke it out with, I think they built off of New Hampshire DES's work, but they broke out different communities, the Great Bay communities in town and said, Exeter, um, Exeter Watershed, if you focused on these top three priorities, we have a grant opportunity 
our top three priorities. One of them was um, septic systems, chemical fertilizer, which we focused on, and um, the third one, space at the moment. But, so the committee got together and said, hey, you know, I think we need to get our town focused on non-point source pollutions, and decided they would apply for the grant. So they drafted up an application, sent it out to the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, Conservation Commission, the Planning Department, and Department of Public Works. They basically gave it to all of the people in town that have an opportunity to partner with the, on this grant. Um, all of the boards, this is rare for a town, all of the boards agreed, and they said, hey, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So the town um, appointed me to kind of organize this committee. We filed uh, an application and were awarded a grant through PREP. And our goal of the project was to consider a z an ordinance that would um, evaluate the potential for adopting fertilizer setbacks from our water bodies. The other aspect of it, because we know that you can't just adopt an ordinance and magically have things change, is educating the public about the impacts of um, fertilizer application on nitrogen load in, in our water bodies. So the influence that we have by fertilizing our lawns on our water quality. So, um, so we applied and were awarded and then immediately got to work. Um, the committee was formed. We developed our, our committee logo and our chart, uh, well our committee makeup was representation from the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, Conservation Commission, um, Water and Sewer Committee, and residents in town who just really are motivated around the subject. And so it, it almost spawned its own, <laughs> its, its own energy and it's been really easy to push this forward because everyone's very organized and motivated. Um, so the first step was we looked at our zoning ordinances in Exeter and we saw that um, prior to this initiative, the zoning amendments, uh, the zoning ordinances um, already have a prohibition for fertilizer application around wetlands. So it was already illegal to apply or against town ordinances to apply fertilizer adjacent to wetlands but our rivers and our streams that provide drinking water sources don't have similar protection. So the committee drafted, because none of the, no one on the committee is an expert in fertilizer, we had to educate ourselves first. We reached out to the expertise with, you know, Jeff Barnum has been a part of this. Conservation Law Foundation has helped us dramatically. UNH Cooperative Extension has met with us several times and gone through a lot of information with us. And they really helped to build that base knowledge that we needed to move forward. So we drafted an ordinance, presented it to the planning board in multiple meetings, um, presented it to the board of selectmen, and after a few tweaks and input from the public, the planning board voted to move the ordinance to the, the voting body. So in March, it went to Exeter's town meeting on the ballot um, for the voters to decide if they were supportive of this amendment. And it passed overwhelmingly. So residents spoke out that this is an issue that they're behind as well. So it was really nice to kind of see this, this um, coming together, all of, all, all of these entities around a similar issue. Um, so that was our first step. Um, but another, another important aspect, like I said, you can't just have something on, on the books and magically change people's behavior. You have to get people to understand that what you do on your lawn is connected to Great Bay, is connected to the Exeter River, the Squamscott River. And a lot of that can only happen through education. If you have a house and you're nowhere near those water bodies, it's not intuitive how they get there. And they get there through our storm drain system. If you ever go down your street and you see a storm drain in, the, in, you know, in, your, in your road, people think intuitively, somehow that water is getting cleaned. Well, it might have some of the sediment removed, but other than that, no, it's basically just a straight shot to our rivers. So water flows in during high rain events across our lawns, picks up material, takes it into the storm drain, and it's a straight shot to our rivers, streams, or wetlands. So, um, so the committee started working on an education program. We have a couple education events. This is one of them. We partnered with um, Great Bay Piscataqua waterkeeper, Jeff Barnum, and um, are hoping that to spread this message. So 
maybe if more people realize that it's really just getting together and sharing information that makes something happen. Um, and then, so on, on the back of your program, you should also have uh, another event that's scheduled for May 14th. That's in Swayze Parkway. Um, for that, we were able to have Margaret Hagen, and you might recognize her name from WMUR's Grow Up Green program. It was, I was kind of a little starstruck when I, when I first met her, but um, she, put, she is really easy to talk to. She puts things in very easy, basic, to understand language. She and her um, collaborators at UNH Cooperative Extension and partners from DES will be hosting a hands-on techniques workshop where you come to Swayze Parkway and learn the bas basics of how to take a soil sample in your yard. You know, it sounds simple, but it's kind of intimidating when you look at the form. Once you get your sample and you turn it in and you get the report, what does all that mean? They'll go through all of these steps with us. So I hope that you can join us um, on 14th in Swayze Parkway. And we're hoping for good weather, but if there isn't good weather, we do have a backup plan. We'll hold it in Town Hall. We will also at that event have, DOT has this terrific stormwater model. It's a trailer that they pull up, and you can actually intuitively start to see what happens when it rains here, and how does all of that stuff end up in Great Bay, or the Squamscott River, or the Exeter River. So we're really looking forward to that. I hope you join us for that event. Um, we're also having, we have a website that's, that's been developed, um, and we're trying to spread the word. We would, what we're trying to do is spread the word on this initiative and get residents, businesses, if you're a lawn care business, to pledge to encourage, you know, a simple set of steps, and we have magnets printed up. It's five steps, and we'll go through them because I don't But to follow those simple steps, and spread the word, pledge, and we'll give you a sticker and a little sign for your lawn. So, um, so really today I hope what you take from my very brief bit is, you know, this doing, do, making a change and committing to make a difference really is, it, it just takes people who are interested and willing and motivated and by capitalizing on people in your, in your own neighborhoods. You know, we, we can make we can make a difference. Um, I hope that you're inspired by the efforts of this committee, and um, and I just want to close with one of my favorite quotes. It's Margaret Mead. I'm sure you've all heard it, but never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. And I really believe that, and I commend the efforts of this committee. And I hope that if you're an Exeter resident or you do business in Exeter, that you'll take a pledge with us. Thanks. Kristen Murphy and, and the, the committee in Exeter. Where is the committee? Can you just raise your hand? Just look around. These are the folks that have been working on this. They really deserve a great day. Now, you can't talk about fertilizers and divorce them from the most common fertilizers that are obviously connected to insecticides and pesticides. And the gentleman from Washington, D.C., Jay Feldman, came up to speak to us tonight. Jay is the co-founder of Beyond Pesticides, and he's been assisting local groups. I've seen Jay speak on several occasions, and uh, he's had a great deal to offer. So I want you to uh, welcome Jay Feldman, if you would, please. Thanks for coming out on such a beautiful evening. Okay, well, it sounds like a lot's going on in town here, and um, I will try to put this pesticide issue in perspective to other actions uh, that you are considering or are looking at in terms of environmental protection, because they're all interwoven and interlinked. We, Beyond Pesticides, was founded 35 years ago by an eclectic group of people that um, we're concerned about our dependency on toxic chemicals in the community, uh, in our food production system, uh, in different aspects of our lives, uh, even for public health uh, management of insect-borne diseases. 
And our, our goal as an organization really is to identify management practices that are not reliant on toxic substances. But before you can do that, you really need to understand, well, what are the deficiencies in the way in which um, government and the private sector re uh, regulates itself, or government regulates those who produce those products that we buy on a daily basis. Common household products that we use in our gardens, um, or we use uh, in our homes as cleaning agents. And the interesting thing, and the reason that my organization spends a lot of time working with people all across the country, is that change really does start here uh, in, the, in the local community. We can't rely on either state government or federal government to really meet the community values that we might have around protecting public health, safety, and the environment. And so it's really important to realize in this conversation as we go through these slides and this, and this discussion that you all, communities, people, play an incredibly important role, not only in your purchasing decisions, what are you going to do around your own home, in the schools, in the parks, but also what can government do to ensure that our communities are responsible actors when it comes to environmental protection and protection of health. We take a lot of guidance from our work, uh, in our work, from uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, many of you may have read her book, um, Silent Spring, and this is, this really 53rd anniversary um, really provides guiding principles for any community that sits down and really looks at these issues. Um, there are core values in this book that are rooted in scientific understanding of biological systems that are central to sustainability. We hear the word sustainability a lot these days, um, and we're going to get into what exactly that means in terms of actual um, restrictions and allowances of chemicals. So the most important point of this slide is complex biological systems. Often we ignore complex biological systems, and Rachel Carson said, by their very nature, chemical controls are self-defeating, for they have been devised and applied without taking into account the complex biological systems against which they have been blindly hurled. We're going to be talking a little bit tonight about soil, soil management, um, and then at the same time she recognized the importance of biological systems and what they mean. Uh, if we want to have a turf system, a green lawn, a playing field, we have to understand the biological systems that we're working with to ensure that. And being ahead of her time, as she was, was as a marine biologist who worked for, for the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Rachel Carson said, to assume that we must resign ourselves to turning our waterways into rivers of death is to follow the counsel of despair and defeatism. We must make wider use of alternative methods. So even back in the 60s, I think scientists were aware of the alternative methods. And, and basically, that's what we're talking about here tonight. So Ms. Carson gave us a lifelong guide to understanding the effects of chemical intensive practices. Uh, but most importantly, she gives us a framework for moving off the chemical treadmill of increasing chemical dependency. And the way she does this, going back to her concept of complex biological systems or communities, um, picking up on that theme, this book called Teeming with Microbes really sort of hits the nail on the head. And they talk about us as gardeners. Smart gardeners know that soil is anything but an inert substance. Healthy soil is teeming with life, not just earthworms and insects, but a staggering multitude of bacteria, fungi, these are beneficial bacteria, fungi, and other microorganisms. When we use chemical fertilizers, we injure the microbial life. We can garden in a way that strengthens the soil food web, which is this complex world of soil-dwelling organisms. So what's in a pesticide? You know, you hear this word a lot. Um, and in fact, what we're talking about when we, when we buy a pesticide is really um, a formulation of different materials. The first part of that formulation is the active ingredient. You've heard of Roundup. So the active ingredient of Roundup is glyphosate. 
And that is not the only product or ingredient in that formulation, because obviously it comes in a, a jug or it has a liquid. So the liquid in which it is mixed is referred to as the inert ingredient. We think of the word inert as being um, innocuous, but in fact inert can be biologically and chemically active and sometimes more active than the toxic, or more toxic than, than the active ingredient. And then chemicals have contaminants in them, uh, such as uh, DDT is actually contaminated in one material, um, and there are dioxins and benzenes and all kinds of toxic impurities. And then chemicals break down as a result of oxidation, exposure to, to the air, exposure to sunlight, and even microbial activities. Um, many compounds break down to nitrosamines, uh, which in and of themselves are uh, hazardous carcinogens. So when you look at the 30 most commonly used chemicals, lawn chemicals, we assembled this list from EPA materials, and we're really, we're talking about probable carcinogens, we're talking about suspected endocrine disruptors, chemicals that cause birth defects, reproductive damage, kidney and liver damage, uh, and 20, 25 are sensitizers. Same thing when we're talking about environmental impacts, groundwater contaminants, toxic to bees and birds, toxic to fish and aquatic organisms. Um, and we're also seeing environmental impacts on aquatic microorganisms and plants and amphibians and fish. We're seeing a lot of intersex species now as a result of endocrine disruptors getting into our water supply. So we see frog deformities that have been linked to pesticides, including atrazine, glyphosate, and other herbicides. And you've probably heard of the impact on butterflies and bees of what we call systemic pesticides. These are chemicals that are literally put into the seed of a plant and then move through the vascular system of that plant and expresses itself through the, through the uh, pollen and nectar and glutation, those little droplets on the plant. So think of that, I mean, it's sort of like inoculating every plant that's in our garden and insects come along, uh, bees and butterflies and birds come along and they then feed on the plant and are inadvertently poisoned. We can talk about how we got to that stage. But in reality, this is part of the complexity of the biological system. Obviously, if you put a chemical out there, there are all kinds of ramifications in terms of impacts, unintended impacts, what we call non-target effects. They're not the effect you're trying to achieve in controlling that target pest, but they're, because of the, that pest is part of an ecological web and interaction with other insects and organisms, we're inadvertently attacking the non-target pest. So that's one complexity, but there are a lot of other complexities out there. There's a complexity of mixtures. We all know we don't use one material or ingredient in our garden. We're using a number of products. We, when we eat a food commodity, we are ingesting a mixture of chemicals that are deemed to be acceptable residues on our food. We don't test for synergistic effects, meaning obviously if two chemicals are mixed together, you can cause a greater effect than either of those individual chemicals alone. This is something we tried to do years ago. In fact, uh, EPA had a program with FDA to look at the interaction between uh, pharmaceuticals and pesticides, uh, especially organophosphates, and found that there were elevated risk factors if, we, if someone was on medication then exposed to a garden chemical, but that program was stopped. Um, we're not fully testing for inert ingredients, as I said earlier. Endocrine disruption, we still do not have in the U.S. a program for evaluating endocrine disruptors. We're working on the protocol to do that. And the interesting thing about endocrine disruptors is that it de it, they defy the basic toxicological principle, which you've heard about, the dose makes the poison. And you think about toxic chemicals, oh yeah, I understand that's a toxic chemical, but I'm really only using a small amount of that chemical. But with endocrine disruptors, it's not that straight line, increased exposure, higher toxicity. It's an inverse dose response curve because you can have impacts at extremely low doses depending on the critical window of vulnerability during spurts of growth. So we're talking about during fetal development, during developmental phases of life, while the body is 
growing and reproducing its cells quickly in endocrine disruptor can have dramatic adverse impacts on organ system development and adverse impacts later in life. So in fact, you might test your blood tissue or your tissue or you might take some type of test for evaluating the residues in your body and you might not find a residue that actually had an effect years prior during developmental phases of life which caused an adverse health outcome. We assume 100% compliance with the label. And if you're like me, you really don't read labels as carefully as you should. And so we see a lot of miss, what we call misuse, that's failure to follow, failure to dilute a product, failure to mix it properly, you know, failure to apply it at, a time, at the time that it is to be applied. You know, the, the actual label of a pesticide product is the law, and that is really the only enforceable aspect of the law. So when a farmer picks up or a gardener picks up a product and reads those instructions, that is the enforceable law. And if there's a violation, you've mixed it improperly, you've applied it over a water body improperly, you've, you have allowed a re-entry into the area before the label allows, that's a violation of the law but very hard to enforce, as you can imagine. We have arbitrary exposure assumptions. Um, this is a lecture that could go on all day, so I'm not gonna go into all the details. So the whole point of this slide is to suggest that we really don't know as much as we should, given the toxic nature of the chemicals we're talking about. These are the old chemicals that are expressly put in the environment, purposefully put into the environment to kill. That is their purpose. They are sides, and yet we don't have all the information we really should from a scientific perspective, and therefore we're left with a whole bunch of uncertainties. Now, built into our federal statute, and you have to understand, that pesticide you see in your hardware store, that pesticide has been registered with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The state of New Hampshire and, virtually, and all the states then enforce the federal law. And most of the state laws, with the exception of, of California and uh, a few other states, New York State, the bigger states that have a higher agricultural use of pesticides, most of them mimic the federal law. They don't adopt additional requirements or restrictions. So the federal law is essentially the state law. And this is a really awkwardly named law, as many are in Congress, called the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, or Identicide Act. We refer to it as FIFRA. And just to, just to give you an idea of the difficulty in pinning down what exactly is that level of exposure that the U.S. government and the state of New Hampshire deems acceptable for you to be exposed to, it's called an unre protecting you and me against an unreasonable adverse effect. And taking into account economic, social, environmental costs and benefits of the use of any pesticide, which equals very little protection. Now, we tried to improve upon that. That's a 1972 law. This is in 1996, we tried to improve upon that. But what came out of the legislative process, which some refer to as sausage making, um, was a reasonable certainty of no harm. Now that sounds pretty good, right? Reasonable certainty of no harm. Well, in the legislation defining what that means, we call it the report language, whoops, um, was the word negligible risk. So EPA, and then your state, develops a standard that relies on what's called negligible risk, or sometimes referred to as de minimis risk. Well, what is de minimis risk? And who is at de minimis risk? We'll get into that a little bit later. But here's where the breakdown comes. It starts with this negligible risk is based on what they call a risk assessment process. And the reason I'm going through all this level of detail is because I'm trying to make the case that there is a tremendous need for local community involvement. There is a tremendous need for parents to protect their children in product choice when they go down to the hardware store or when they go down to the food store and buy the, the weekly groceries. There is a tremendous need for school districts to question how they are managing their playing fields. There's a tremendous need for local communities to evaluate what they're doing in their park system. And these are the flaws. I mean, you could, read, you could study this for um, the next month, 
but there are key deficiencies starting with the risk assessment process what they call conditional registration where products are literally put on the market without complete testing do you know that all that what they call the neonicotinoid pesticides either these are those systemic pesticides i was explaining earlier that move through the vascular system and end up in the pollen and nectar do you know that all those chemicals were registered under conditional registration where epa did not have any field studies of impacts on bees that was a condition that was established at the time of registration saying we don't think there'll be a problem we'll collect that data data later there's another chemical in prelis uh, that made national news headlines uh, about almost two years ago now that was put on the market and was killing evergreen trees because epa said we'll collect that data later and found that in fact the data was critical to an adverse health impact lack of ish of efficacy does the chemical really do what it is intended today, next year, and the year after? Big topic of discussion. And then inadequate enforcement I mentioned, and all kinds of other exemptions around emergencies. So I'm not going to go through this in much detail, but the bottom line here, folks, is that when we talk about risk, you know, we think of risk, you know, we go out every day and we, we, we have risks in our lives. We drive cars, we, we get involved in extreme sports, we cross the street, whatever. But here is a risk that has such a high degree of uncertainty. The real question is, is it really a risk that is worth it? In other words, are the benefits that we're deriving from these risks acceptable? And what do those risks mean to me? I may have a pre-existing condition. I may be a cancer survivor. I may have a neurological deficit. I may be, as I am, aging, and therefore my immune system and my neurological system is not what it was when I was younger and healthier. So I am much more vulnerable to exposure to a neurotoxic chemical and a chemical that's immune suppressive. These are things that are not evaluated in the risk assessment process. We look at average people of average body weight and we assume um, essentially uniformity across the population and then we end up with a risk number. So that's another reason to really delve into this whole thing. Okay, so we, we tried to step back from all this and say, well, what's really going on in the scientific literature? Well, here's all, you know, you've been talking to me about policy and risk calculation and all this, but what's really going on? What are we seeing out there in the population? And we decided several years ago to set up a database called Pesticide-Induced Diseases Database where we looked at the public health outcomes of chemicals and we tracked all the science on pesticides and Parkinson's, pesticides and... Uh, diabetes, pesticides and neurological reproductive diseases. And now we have, as of a few weeks ago, 760 studies you can get on our database and look at this extraordinary database that connect these chemicals to diseases we're experiencing in our families. I mean, direct, cor direct correlations. Alzheimer's. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that these chemicals initiated these diseases. But it, it can be, they can be initiators or promoters of disease. So even if you have a, pre, a predetermined or you know, genetic condition in your family, your family history, or you have a, you know, vulnerabilities I described earlier, exposure to that chemical exacerbates that disease endpoint and that public health disease outcome. So it's not, this is what I like to do in these, these presentations is point out that we're deriving this information from governmental documents often. They just, they're buried, you know, they're sort of, they spend all this money, produce a report, it might make a little headline somewhere, but this is the U.S. Geological Survey saying, not doing a really good job of looking at mixtures. The chemicals um, exceed the benchmarks. At virtually every chemical they looked at had one benchmark of environmental impact, um, impact on streams, shallow wells, deep wells, aquifers, um, etc. Um, we have a legacy problem. So in addition to these new chemicals that we talk about, we have all the old ones, the DDTs, the chlor remember chloridane is a termite insecticide, does that ring a bell with anybody? It was very widely used 
legacy chemical, very long half-life, still in the environment. You can test any water body, you're going to find um, the breakdown product of DDT uh, there in, the, in, the, in that body of water. It shows up virtually every year in USDA's uh, market basket survey of, of food residues. Um, and then the medical community has weighed in over the years. Uh, the Ontario, in Canada, the Ontario College of Physi Family Physicians um, basically raised questions about, in a systemic review, about consistent links between pesticides and serious illnesses. The American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, a couple years ago, looked at this whole question and um, uh, basically said that, uh, that documented exposure from a conventional diet, meaning a non-organic diet. American Public Health Association, American Medical Association. Now, meanwhile, we also look at the international arena, what's going on around the world, and you can see by looking at the European Union that we're just not moving fast enough in this country. Yet another reason for a local community like Exeter to get involved in this issue and the whole region, because look on glyphosate alone, the International Agency for Research on Cancer last year found, this is the World Health Organization, that Roundup, you've all heard of Roundup, it's the most widely used herbicide in the country, um, that, that this chemical uh, was a probable human, or is a probable human carcinogen. And yet, it's going to probably take years until we see this chemical being removed from the market. Uh, neonicotinoids, also, the ones that are in the, the, the uh, pollen and the nectar, that chemical's been banned in the European Union, or suspended. So we're behind the curve when it comes to, and one of the reasons we're behind the curve is because we don't operate in this country under the basic precautionary principle which is the way I raised my kids, and I'm sure you did too. You basically said, you know, wear a helmet, wear your seatbelt, even before it was a requirement of law, because you said, you know, we're hedging our bets here, we want to protect you, we're going to be precautionary as a parent, we're going to take precaution. Um, and what the European Union does is they embrace that concept as a matter of regulatory policy, whereas the U.S. is more crisis-driven, we have a crisis, we have a study, and then we respond to the crisis, and as a result, we're, we're constantly playing catch up with the science. The biggest problem I see in all of this is we ignore those uncertainties. And the, what we do is, with pesticides, check this out, we add to every pesticide calculation, these are scientific calculations based on assumptions that have deficiencies, whatever, we add a tenfold extra margin of safety. So we have all these recognized uncertainties, and then we, so we multiply the number we determine as a safe level, and we multiply it by 10 and lower the acceptable residue. Well, if it's an endocrine disruptor, right, and you, your kids are exposed or you're exposed during a critical window of vulnerability, then multiplying an unknown times 10 is still an unknown, in my view. So, Local action is where it's at, and that's what's happening across this country. And it was, things were moving so quickly that the chemical industry moved in to virtually every state legislature. The Supreme Court upheld the right of local communities to adopt ordinances that were more restrictive than your state law. Went to, went to every state, and in 43 states was able to get the state legislature to preempt your authority. So the authority you have over smoking, or you know, zoning, or public health protections that you have, your board of health, your zoning board, um, you do not have authority over pesticides. Now you can control, under New Hampshire law, you can control what is done on public property under your jurisdiction, your parks, your schools, your, re your meeting, strips and you can you can create a model for the private for private landowners but you can't control like your, your neighbors to the north maine we'll talk about this in a minute maine communities townships do have the authority to exceed the state standard and we're seeing a wave of activity occurring just across the border so that gets me a little upset because where what happened to our democratic right you know and our ability to protect ourselves when deemed necessary. <clears throat> so local authority was upheld by the Supreme Court. 
we've evaluated uh, the types of preemption, but the bottom line is um, it, it's a very difficult situation in the 43 states, including New Hampshire. So our whole goal with this we, is to ask the question, do we need toxic chemicals to achieve the pest management goal we're seeking to achieve? Whether it's mosquito management or it's lawn care, um, what are the pest conducive conditions? What are the, the conditions on the ground that create the problem we're trying to solve? Whether it's a weed in a, in a turf system or it's an insect um, in our community. And we believe our law should be incentivizing non-toxic systems and, and defining acceptable materials in that context. Whereas the law I've been talking about, FIFRA, or the other, the 1996 law, which is called the Food Quality Protection Act, institutionalizes products and practices defining acceptable levels of risk. So that whole risk assessment thing with one times 10 to the negative six, which means one excess cancer per million population, a lot of wiggle. I've been over to EPA, I walked into the administrator's office, I said, I, we looked at your numbers and it is eight excess cancers per million population. That's only one chemical for a few uses. And they say, well, that's not really a hard and fast number of one excess cancer. But that's what they put on paper. And so we're institutionalizing hazards based on a risk assessment assumptions with inherent limitations. So, we sat down in 1990 to say, look, we know there are farmers out there that are growing food without toxic chemicals. We know there are lawn care operators out there that are starting to do this. And we've got about 25 states now that are actually certifying organic food. Let's write a national, federal law that defines food production in the organic sector. And we did that before there was a Whole Foods, before there was Horizon Milk, before you saw any processed food. This was 1990. And so we didn't have all the pressures of big industry coming in and saying, we need this material, we need that material. And we sat down, and the first thing we said is, if you're going to be a farmer under this organic system, you've got to come up with an organic system plan. You have to have a system plan for how you're going to manage this farm. And you must not use synthetic materials. And if you do use synthetic materials, you have to subject it to three criteria. You have to look at whether you're having any, any adverse impacts on health and the environment. You have to look at whether you are compatible with that system. And that system must take into account biodiversity. It must take into account the complex biological system that Rachel Carson talked about. Because it was known to every organic farmer that you did not have an organic farm unless you had that complex biological system working and contributing, producing nitrogen, nutrients, cycling nutrients, and doing all the things we wanted to do. So organic agriculture is an ecological production, so ecological meaning complex biological community recognition, production system that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, soil biological activity. This is in our federal law. It is based on minimal use of off-farm inputs and our management practices that restore, maintain, restore, maintain, and enhance. It's the principle of improvement, and we call this regeneration. No organic farmer should be farming unless they're regenerating the soil, putting life back into it, nurturing it, enhancing it, and, and, and improving it. So this is what you get from a 35-year longitudinal study at the Rodale Institute where they maintain two fields and have done it for 30 years, one chemical intensive on the left and one on the right. And what do you see? You see all kinds of things in here. You see biological activity. You know what else you see in here? You see carbon. Because this organic system is taking atmospheric carbon and putting it into the ground. So it's contributing to reduction in global climate uh, protections you know, in, in the area of global climate change. And, you, you, and Chip will talk about this, you're also restoring and um, retaining water. You're creating a system here that holds the water, holds the material in place, um, nurtures the biological activity in the soil. And that's why it's this color. But Chip is the expert on this. 
So here, I, I did an unannounced audit on Chip's playing field in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Chip Osborne from Osborne Organics, who will be speaking next. And this is just to show you, he has a lot more uh, descriptive slides, but to show you that we can meet our expectations with these organic systems. And that the same principles that are in our federal law on organic food production, and certified by the way, organic is real, the label actually does mean something on their food products. Um, and these systems produce a playing field that oft oftentimes looks better than a chemical intensive field, is more resilient, requires less water, and requires less expensive off-farm inputs, including fertilizers, which is the big thing here. Eliminates that input over time, so you're actually producing that naturally. And Chip will get into the whole difference between soluble and insoluble material and what that means to water runoff and water effect and development of soil health. So, we're an advocacy organization, Beyond Pesticides, as well as a scientific information agency. We believe everything we're doing is science-based. It is science -based. But we advocate for improved protections. We utilize and advocate for local authority. We urge you to engage, as it sounds like you are on this. We want better enforcement. We still want the New Hampshire Department of Ag out there enforcing against labeling violations. We want to see better reporting. We want Congress more involved in this. And we want to advocate, and we advocate for organic practices, policies, and protect organic standards. But the last part of this talk will be focused on how local communities are evolving and having this kind of conversation we're having tonight and then taking it to the policy arena. So what I want to do is share with you just a sampling of that discussion and how it's going. So Greenwich, Connecticut, where Chip does a lot of work, the town adopted an ordinance that basically said the town of Greenwich, absent any of the exceptions to, sorry for the typo, to the general rule set forth below, shall not use any pesticides or herbicides. Pesticides is really a phrase that, that is an umbrella term for insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, or dendicides, all the sides, which are classified or designated, or which contain any substances which are classified as designated as the following. And so this is saying, if a chemical is a carcinogen and listed on California's Proposition 65 list, if it's highly acutely toxic, if it's cancer-causing, oh, California Prop 65 also includes reproductive effects, all right? Endocrine disruptor or adverse impact on organ systems. And for many years, this was the construct by which Communities got together and said, we don't want our communities exposed to these chemicals that have these characteristics. And they set out to design a program of management, of land management, that incorporated this as a value, as an ethic. This is a, a community value. Um, and as things evolved over time, we've develop the flip side of this. This was just adopted last year in Montgomery County, Maryland, right outside Washington, D.C., a million residents. They are allowed to restrict pesticides on private property under Maryland state law, just like Maine. And they, they chose to flip the coin on this and go on the, the other way, mimicking the Organic Foods Production Act by t developing a positive list of allowed materials. And this seems to be where things are at. So this, they created a law that said our community value is to align our land management programs with organic systems that only utilize organic compatible materials. And it's sort of easy to do because you can point to this federal law and this code of federal regulations that actually lists materials and then you can walk down to your hardware store and most, many of those materials are listed with a, a little stamp or uh, the code that says that this product has been reviewed and is listed by the Organic Materials Review Institute which essentially takes those standards that are allowed under federal law, the organic law, 
and attaches uh, those standards to an individual product. So it evaluates that product as being in compliance with the standards. So that, in essence, creates or reduces the uh, requirement that the town you know, engage at a very high level in terms of identifying product. It's the product essentially is identified in the private sector by this continual listing of products that are in compliance. Now, there may be some products out there that CHIP might recommend that are essentially, um, that are not yet OMRI listed. And those, you know, those can be worked through with organizations like ours to define compatibility with the standard. So anyway, Algonquin, Maine, I'm getting the, the the, the time clock has run out here, but you know, Gunquit made another leader in the country on this, and I'm so glad that John Bogart is here today. Bogart is here today from Eldridge uh, Lumber and Hardware in New York, Maine, because that hardware store and his boss Scott Eldridge and John played it played an instrumental role in educating the community that yes, we could function as a business as a community with the value that we don't want to indiscriminately uh, poison wildlife and people. And so Ogunquit um, embraced this Montgomery County type of ordinance, as did other communities. Uh, this is just to show you that they're up the coast, there are numerous communities, and even in the Midwest, <laughs> that have embraced this concept that yes, our community believes uh, that we want to embrace a precautionary principle, we want to follow the scientific uh, understanding, and we believe we can manage our land systems without poisoning uh, the environment, water, and people. So I leave this quote with you. Can, this is Rachel Carson. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? And that's me. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that compelling presentation. I, we want to give the opportunity to folks uh, to ask some questions of Jay uh, before we take a break. Are there any questions out there? Yes. In those communities that have actually implemented these restrictions, does that also imply that merchants can no longer sell those and they're prohibited from selling those products? Yeah. No. No. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think what's happening is that, uh, in the, first of all, in a community like this, as an example, that would choose what it does on its own land, um, would be restricted by its own policy. So the policy would affirm its commitment to only purchase certain types of products. So it wouldn't be a problem in the public sector. Um, I think these laws are so new that communities are trying to figure this out. But they all, at least Montgomery County, requires a high degree of education at the site of purchase. So if you go into a hardware store in Montgomery, this will play out over the next year, there will be signage required by law that explain that XYZ products may not be used in Montgomery County. So, you know, we all live in areas that are near other area jurisdictions that allow these things, and I think it's the uh, reasoning of the elected officials that they don't want to interfere with the stream of commerce, in some cases interstate commerce, when it comes to the sale, but they can, they can regulate the use. So, in a perfect world, would you want it regulated? Yes, but you know, I'll tell you, in Canada, Home Depot has moved all their product line because of the, the ordinances to be compliant uh, with these ordinances that eliminate or, you know, make this a violation of law. So, it, you know, there's enough empirical evidence out there to show that a restriction on use can have and does have a dramatic impact on the ultimate uh, contamination of that community. I'd like to introduce Chip Osborne. Chip is from Marblehead, Mass. He has been involved in organic lawn care for many years. He's a horticulturist and he has got a, a great deal to tell us on how we can
take care of our lawns in an organic fashion and how we can go after the real problems of soil health. Please welcome Chip Osborne. is, uh, you, know, you sort of heard the disturbing news, uh, you know, tonight about the issue of, of how we're managing. You heard about the low-hanging fruit, you know, how we can reduce uh, nitrogen. You've heard about, you know, the pesticide issue. Uh, and it really is all tied together because if we looked at Great Bay and looked at these rivers, we would find pesticides in there. Uh, you know, you saw that. So it's all about managing you know, management practices. And, and what I'm going to take you is sort of the high level overview. Uh, this discussion is not something unique to Exeter. I travel around the country, as does Jay. And this is a subject that we address nationally uh, from the water quality, the environmental perspective, and the human and specifically children's health perspective. So the idea that it's the changes that we can make on our own private uh, property that I just took a residential, and that's what it is. This is not abutting water. Uh, it is in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and we're surrounded on three sides by water. The town is uh, four miles long and a mile and a half wide. Um, but what happens on this property, which is in the middle of the town, ultimately can end up an effect because it gets down into groundwater and can move and become very cold. So the idea that just because we do not live on a body of water doesn't mean that our management practices in our own private spaces don't have a negative effect. Because if you, you know, if people are subscribing to the, you know, the management program or the four-step program, and there's, you know, several hundred, several thousands, or, or even more just using that kind of product, basically all goes somewhere, and it honestly does not all go into the grass. So what I'll do is walk you through some of the steps, some of the differences between what I call conventional or chemical management, that management that we have been taught how to manage our landscapes by corporations. We've been taught by corporations that want to generate revenue. And I can guarantee you that those corporations don't really care whether your lawn looks good, bad, or indifferent, as long as they make the sale of the product that, that you are managing in the way that they want you to manage. And we've been doing it that way since the Second World War. When we manage a landscape, a managed landscape, one that we are taking care of, we have lost, lost the sight of the fact that we need to mimic what happens in nature. So all of chemical or conventional management has nothing to do with the natural world. We are relying on chemistry to intervene in nature, and many times if it's a pesticide, to go to war with nature because we have some overarching design or goal on how we think things should be managed because we're not happy with the way that things are happening. That grass there and all the grass you see here in Exeter, New Hampshire is non-native to the United States. It all came from Western Europe and the British Isles. And in its natural environment, it was never managed as a monoculture. It is a horticultural plant that has always been, since day one, part of a diverse horticultural landscape. We have brought it here over the last 250, 300 years and we have been taught since World War II that we have to manage it as a monoculture. Anybody that's horticulturist understands that managing as a monoculture is difficult. Managing a non-native is difficult. Now, I'm not up here saying that we should have dandelions and plantain and crabgrass and lawn, and if that's what nature wants to put there, we should sit back and accept that. I wouldn't be around if that was my philosophy. Because I deal with clients, Jay and I manage 10 or 12 national parks, the National Park Service as volunteers. I manage high profile estates, school districts, municipalities, you'll see some pictures. And the gun is to my head. I have to manage the 5% minus weed pressures across the board. And that's basically what chemicals do. Chemicals do not get rid of, do not get rid of 100% of the weeds 100% of the time. They only get rid of part of them. If we are managing on the four-step program, we are on a pesticide treadmill. And unless we break that treadmill and get off of it, we're never, we're always going to have this sort of chemical dependency. My focus isn't going to be pesticides, but if you, 
you know, this kind of an applicator is coming in. In that spray is some soluble nitrogen fertilizer, and there is also a weed killer in there, and look at how that guy is dressed. And that company will tell you that as soon as that product is dried to the touch, that side goes on there, and then that can happen. Kind of counterintuitive, when the pesticide that's in there might have a half-life of 100 days, meaning it's persistent in the environment. So whether it's dry or not dry doesn't make any difference whatsoever. A chemical is there, every chemical has a half-life, every chemical breaks down at different amounts of time. We were all taught and sold by Monsanto that Roundup was the safe weed killer because it's systemic, it translocates right down through the root, comes in contact with the soil, and then becomes neutralized, so it's no big deal. But what they didn't tell you all that is, yes, when it comes in contact with the soil, the active ingredient of glyphosate is neutralized. But the secondary and tertiary breakdown product compounds are more toxic than what came out of the bottle. We just were never told that. That science has been around for a long time. So that's the kind of approach that we have. Whether we're in a homeowner sector, lawn care professionals, municipality, school districts, we can manage all kinds of these properties. And we're managing it on what I call a systems-based approach. We've all been taught to manage by looking at the grass and focusing on those blades of grass, when we really should be looking at a, a system where we focus on grass, soil, and everything that's related in that. So when I get called in on a consultation to a site, the first thing I, 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 I want to know is, what do we have for soils? And we do soil testing to determine that. That's really the first step. That's where it is not really what we look at up there, it's what we actually don't see. So organic land care, organic land management, it's an adoption of a system-based approach versus a product approach. Four-step program is a product-centered approach where there are four bags that are sold in 26 cool season states to be put down at the same time of the year, the same rate, and the same product with widely diverse landscape, widely different soils, and there's no attention paid to whether it's in the Northeast, the Northwest, the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, just all the same, just put this stuff down. Very different things are happening in soils in Illinois and soils here in New Hampshire. So conceptually, we're approaching this very differently. Uh, we are a problem-solving strategy in the organic world, not symptom-treating. If you have crabgrass in your lawn, people say, I have a problem in my lawn, I have crabgrass. Crabgrass isn't the problem. Crabgrass is a symptom of a bigger problem. If you have a bare spot the size of a silver dollar, if you have thin turf, not enough plants in a square foot, if you're cutting it very short, if the soil is very compacted, chances are you'll have crabgrass because it's everywhere. U.S. government brought crabgrass from Asia to the United States as a forage crop, and that was a failure. And now we have it as an invasive, non-native, warm season grass. So it thrives when cool season grass struggles for the middle of the summer. But crabgrass is only the symptom. So what are we taught? We're taught by a corporation to buy a bag of pre-emergent crabgrass control every April and put it down, and you won't have crabgrass. So you're treating the symptom chemically and you do that every April. So we're about a problem-solving strategy. We know that if we maybe aerate the soil, if we switch to organic fertilizers and build microbial life in the soil, if we use the grass seed, if we move the mowing height up to three inches, we'll get rid of crabgrass. We'll get rid of it in, in 12, 14 months. But the chemical company that sells you that pre-emergent crabgrass control has no interest in solving your crabgrass problem what happens if you solve the problem? What happens to the revenue from that corporation? It goes right down. So their revenue stream is based on us buying that product every year to treat a symptom. We're looking at the foundation of creating a healthy, biologically active soil, and we soil test to determine what exactly we need. Uh, you know, some people's perception of organic is I don't do anything, therefore I'm organic. When we talk about organic lawn care or natural turf management, Implication is a well thought out, proactive approach to management that uses natural or organic products. That being said, just because a product is natural or organic does not mean you throw caution to the wind. 
Organic products can cause harm. Organic products can have unintended consequences. Uh, but those organic products are not generally linked to long-term human health or environmental issues. So in that respect, they're much better, but again, we use it by caution. A good definition of organic management is simply putting a series of preventative steps in place to build a healthy biological system. These are all the reasons why, you know, we may choose to go organic, and I always end that discussion with saying, we go organic because we want the landscape to get better. And if you have the opportunity to see a healthy three, four, or five year organically maintained turf system, you would not walk away from there and say that it doesn't look better than the chemical counterpart across the street. That's what happens when you bring that healthy biological in place. As Jay said, these, here are all of the pesticides and I can't tell you how often, uh, even at homeowner level, but even in the professional industry, I don't use any pesticides, I only use herbicides for weeds. Herbicides are very much a pesticide, so it's everybody's personal choice, uh, you know, how they come down on this pesticide 101 issue. Um, you know, it, 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 the bottom line is, these are all the reasons for the discussion, so the focus here is water quality, some folks come at it from the public health or the children's health issue, Different reasons, same goal. Uh, going green means starting locally here. Um, let me just go right through here. Here is the crux of my presentation. This is the systems-based approach, a basic understanding of soil biology. So everybody here in the room had a biology teacher in high school at some point that put up their hand and said, a handful of soil contains billions of organisms that are alive. Most of them beneficial, that nature put there to help us grow something. Four-step program and conventional management bypasses all of that because none of the biological activity or life in the soil has anything to do with the way those products work. The second part of it is the exclusive use of natural organic products, meaning if it is our desire to eliminate pesticides, we also need to eliminate those synthetic fertilizers. Synthetic water-soluble fertilizers inherently create a dependence upon pesticide control product by the way they work. So any fertilizer regulation that doesn't restrict soluble nitrogen really isn't doing its job. So a fertilizer regulation needs to address soluble versus insoluble forms of nitrogen. And then we have the cultural practices, those things that we do, the right way to water. I bet 75% of homeowners that have in-ground irrigation systems are watering improperly. Grass doesn't need a lot of water. So we look at those things. We look at seeding and overseeding and irrigation, whether the soil is compacted. All of those things would be what we call the cultural practice. So a systems-based approach is the opposite of the product approach, but it's addressing each one of these three areas and bringing them together uh, to grow our lawns. The bottom line is it doesn't matter anymore whether everybody in the room agrees about whether they like synthetics or don't like synthetics. Simply put, the market nationally is changing. And it's changing rapidly because people are beginning to question what they're putting down, why they're putting it down, and now the fact that we have alternatives. I don't have to stand up. Five years ago, ten years ago, I had to argue with the chemical industry. I had to sit there and prove why, I, you know, why we didn't need their pesticides. The simple thing is now, the answer is, I don't need them because we, we can grow without them. You're gonna see some pictures that have had no chemicals whatsoever, and the landscape is just as good as the more better than the one uh, that, 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 that has the chemicals. Jay and I manage Fort Scott in, in Kansas. It's, a, it's an 1840s parade ground that had a fort, and, and we did for the National Park Service. And they split the parade ground right in the middle, and they did the Scott's four-step program here, and they did the our organic program there. At the end of the three-year formal trial, the end result was they don't look any different. So they got rid of the four-step program and made it all a natural program. So World War II is where this all came from. Chemical warfare research. Uh, they marketed it to big business agriculture, got rid of insect, weed, and disease. Uh, and, and yields per acre increase just like they promised it would. If you go back to those same farms today, there's so much soil damage, yields per acre are less than they were. Now they moved into the residential market in the 1950s after the ag market was saturated. And the first thing they did was tell us that, that clover we had in our lawn is a weed. 
prior to the Second World War, nobody bought organic, nobody bought bags of fertilizer. There wasn't really any lawn fertilizer. White clover was part of every grass seed mix, and we recycled our grass clippings. And that's how we got all the nitrogen we needed. All of a sudden, industry came along and said, that clover's a weed. I've got a problem here. I have a product to kill the weed. And I just happen to have a bag of nitrogen over here. I'll be glad to sell you, because you just lost all that nitrogen when you killed that weed. So those were marketed together. So all of that comes from, so it's only been this very short time frame where we have been taught to manage synthetically. As I said, all grasses are non-native. So if we're managing conventionally or chemically, it's synthetic fertilizers, it's chemical pesticides, it's a quick fix, product-based uh, approach that treats symptoms, doesn't solve problems. Uh, applications are generally prescribed by the calendar. Many times multiple applications, many times prophylactic use of pesticides. Uh, I, I think the average homeowner is so scared of drug activity in the lawn that they're very susceptible to buying those products now that go down in June, just in case, so that you don't have drug. Uh, you know, when you understand that you put a drug treatment down in June, that chemical is active for about 220 days. It's not a short-term thing. It's in there for the duration of the summer. Uh, you know, that's where, you know, sort of where we've gotten to. Natural product uh, in, 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 is the exclusive use that we use. So our nutrients come from animal byproducts, from grains, from minerals. Nitrogen, organic nitrogen is, is protein-based from animal byproducts, meaning manures or fish, and then soy or corn. Uh, Long-term benefit, solves problems. We build healthy soils. Um, this is an all-natural landscape, large, large property, 10-acre property that is uh, is 98% uh, like organic and has been since 2009, and there are no serious problems on that landscape. So we've addressed issues as they've come along. Um, we uh, have two ways that we can manage. We can manage using allowed pesticides, or we manage without pesticides. And the appropriate way to manage is without pesticides. And then if we need to, Jay talked about the positive list. We have a big long list of materials that can take the place of some of the synthetics. Um, you know, you may have all heard of integrated pest management. We embrace the concept of organic integrated pest management where we make the right decisions, but the product that we use at the end is OMRI certified, Organic Materials Review Institute certified, or approved for organic production. And on that list, we have insecticides, we have herbicides, we have fungicides. So it really is about education and understanding uh, the uh, product that we have. We manage to communicate expectations. Low, low expectations require uh, uh, you know, can be a lower quality, and it's not necessarily bad. High expectations are higher quality, and that's not always necessarily good. Uh, it's the right expectation for the right site. So if we have the higher expectations, it's a, uh, it's a higher product cost, and uh, it lower, product, lower expectations, lower product cost. So the analogy I make is if you're in the four-step program and you only put down two bags of the four, you're going to get a different result than if you put down all four. So we end up with organic is, is sort of the same way. It's really how the program is designed. A big focus of what we do is train the landscape community and teach them if the market demand is your request of your landscape or if you have a service provider, to do it in a natural way in a municipality if it's outsourced to, the, to a uh, private contractor. Um, it's, it's indicating to them that this is what we want. That drives them to the table to get the education. There's no question there's too much grass in the United States. Uh, grass lawns cover the size of the state of Nebraska. Uh, golf course is the size of the state of Connecticut. But the bottom line is that a lot of grass is not going to go away. You know, that appropriate amount of grass around our residential uh, properties, public parks, athletic fields for our children, uh, sporting turf, it's not going to go away. The bottom line is that here with everything that we look at since the Second World War and the environmental damage that's happened and the implications with human health that Jay talked about, the idea now that when we manage grass in the future, we have to be able to manage it uh, in a non-chemical framework. This is all part of a natural system, so we're not looking at sacrificing quality. 
So when we begin, we're taking a feed the soil approach as opposed to a feed the plant approach. So if you are using an organic fertilizer, you are feeding the microbial life in the soil with that fertilizer. And then that microbial life is breaking it down to the form that the plant can use, and then you're building that biomass. <coughs> Synthetic fertilizers do not do that. Synthetic fertilizers feed the plant, organic fertilizers feed the soil, and the soil in turn feeds the plant. Difference between the types of fertilizers, conventional or chemical-based fertilizer, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are all salt. They're all mineral salts in a bag that have been created in a laboratory to mimic the forms that the plant can use. It is foundation in urea, synthetic, inorganic, water-soluble, fast release, fast green up, rapid uptake. It can be encapsulated to slow it down. The water has to erode the coating. Um, directly feeds the plant, leaves the soil quickly, takes five ton of natural gas and oil to make one ton of this fertilizer. So a five ton petrochemical input for a one ton fertilizer output. When we use this soluble material, once it comes in contact with water or soil moisture, uh, it's released and starts to work in two days. Seven to 10 days after the application is maximum release. If it rains, any significant rain event in that seven to 10 day period, the grass can't process the nitrogen fast enough and it goes right into groundwater or finds its non-target source. Four to six weeks after the application, it's all gone. So it's a very short-lived, quick fix type of a product. Natural organic is water insoluble nitrogen. So what happens, the nitrogen in an organic fertilizer is in the organic form, and the plant can't use that. The plant can only use inorganic nitrogen, in nitrate or ammonium. So we synthesize that in the laboratory to make it easy with the chemical base. We are now relying on the biology in the soil to make the conversion for us. So we open up a bag of organic fertilizer, put it down, bacterial organisms process that, and they convert it into that ammonium and nitrate, but it's in a non-leachable form because it happens hour by hour, day by day, week by week, and there's never a big release in any one, at any one time, and the nitrogen is actually held in the body of the biomass and the organisms and then made available slowly to the plant. When we're managing uh, grass, we're also coming up with the appropriate cultural practices. Uh, the, cultural, uh, the cultural practices of um, mowing. The right height for an organic lawn is three inches. Uh, you know, sports fields are entirely different. Ball roll is a technical sports turf term that we use to determine how short we need to cut the grass. So if we're managing a field hockey field, we're cutting it down to an inch and a half or an inch and three quarters. If we're managing baseball or soccer or football, it's all the appropriate height for that sport but three inches and sharp mower blades, recycling grass clippings, we should never be bagging and removing. You can reduce, uh, if you recycle grass clippings into your lawn, you can eliminate a fertilizer application because you're putting a pound of nitrogen right back into that lawn just by cutting the grass and leaving those clippings. They will break down and decompose the saprophytic organisms uh, within 12 hours. So you're actually re returning organic matter and, and recycling right back in there. Irrigation, uh, somebody's got a sprinkler in their, in their yard that the, the installer comes in and probably sets the time clock to run every other day or three times a week for 10 or 15 minutes a zone, when in reality it should be run twice a week for 30 or 40 minutes a zone. Deep, thorough irrigation, far more preferable to repeated shallow irrigation. Repeated shallow keeps the roots up at the surface, so then when it gets hot in July and August, the lawn is struggles. When we're goal, our goal in, in natural management is to drive that root system down as deep as we can, get thick, healthy turf that will choke out the most broadleaf weeds. It's amazing. When I, have, I have a trial site that I'm working on now, and a uh, Kentucky Bluegrass saw a trial for reduction of nitrogen. And, and dandelions are blown in from the neighborhood because people don't manage the lawns in this neighborhood. It's dandelions all in there. But it's amazing to watch the grass choking that dandelion right up. So the grass gets so thick that it literally chokes the dandelion out because grass is a thug. 
And if you do it properly, it will outcompete. We aerate to relieve compaction. So, it, you know, if it's, you know, aeration can be renting an aerator at Home Depot or taking it back. You can have a landscaper do it. Exciting thing that we're working on now is biological aeration. Within a couple of years, we're going to be able to have a concoction that you could buy, put in a little hose and sprayer, buy a hose and sprayer for $12, water the lawn, and aerate, and let the microbes do the work for you. That's the kind of science that's coming behind natural lawn care. So instead of trouble, tr struggling with a 400-pound aerator, how cool would that be to take a little packet and put it into a hose and sprayer, water the lawn, and know that you're loosening up the soil because of active biological life. Choices and challenges for natural turf management on a large scale, parks, athletic fields, school district properties. This is about reducing synthetic fertilizers on acres and acres of grass, like around here, I mean, even the fertilizer that's used on the school property. If we're using water-soluble fertilizer, it's not staying here, it's getting down there, and it's going off somewhere. So when we're talking about fertilizing acres and acres at a time, sustainable way to do it is with natural fertilizers and then you know the other piece of the discussion is reducing and eliminating pesticides where our children play and that's really the piece and Jay touched on that we're not looking at that acute exposure anymore you know that that, that FIFRA talks about and risk assessment talks about and when they laboratory tested it's important that you know that when all these pesticides are tested EPA is not testing much chemical manufacturer tests it on their own and submits their data to the EPA. And it's based on acute oral or dermal toxicity to laboratory animals. And then they watch what happens. And then they extrapolate those numbers to the human population. But they extrapolate it to be a 150-pound male, not an infant, woman, child, toddler. That's a problem. So that's why athletic field management is an issue. I showed this slide to a group of turf professionals uh, that included the National Football League, Major League Baseball, uh, all the big guys. I went down to Florida, 175 chemical guys packed into the room. And uh, I showed them this slide and I said, what if you put 2,4-D down there? 2,4-D, by the way, is the main line weed killer in the four-step program. And uh, what if you put 2,4-D and you would go out there with gloves and you would go out there with protective lawn clothing and you might even have a mask. And what if that was your daughter, her face in the grass, and her water bottle was there two or three days after you put it down, what would your comfort level be? And they were shocked. Because their education had never allowed them to make that correlation in that type of management. I'll just run you through some quick pictures to show you that, you know, I can talk, I can talk for the next three hours. I could probably sit skeptical and say, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure this organic can really work. I've worked with Boulder since 2010. Municipal neighborhood park, it was only six or seven years old. Uh, cool season grass, the same as here. Uh, you can see what the before and after pictures were, all during the active growing season. This, feed, this park was so bad, they were gonna rip it up after six years and redo it. And I said, well, no, we're doing an organic program all around the city. Let's include this, Let, let's make it a challenge. Uh, very compacted, bare spots, it was anaerobic, you could smell the alcohols in there from, from in no, no oxygen, it was waterlogged. It was just a very horrible situation. So there it is before management. When we tried to take a soil sample, that's all we could get. It's all thatch and root, very unhealthy system. Minimal density, you can see all the bare spots. A lot of weeds, big clover pressure, crabgrass pressure, and there it is after we transition and moving through, and you go and look, and there it is, the close-up, the weeds are gone. We've replaced the weeds with grass because we changed the system. We systematically used natural products and programs to change that system to be more conducive to growing grass and less susceptible to weed pressure. Another project in Colorado, lots of synthetic fertilizer, lots of chemical pesticides. They were using synthetic fertilizer right along the riverbed. And the mayor said, what's the big deal? We've been doing it 40 years, the river's still there. But it was testing toxic downstream, but it was, you know, so up here. Big, big, big pressure with synthetics. It's almost a year and a half after stopping pesticides, cold turkey, and just going into a thoughtful natural program that addressed soils and soil health first and foremost. 7.3 acres of high-profile sports turf, and you can't find a weed in there after a year and a half. 
Here's one of the fields in Marblehead that we've been working on. This was built in 2006. Marblehead has had a policy in place that no pesticides or synthetic fertilizers on all town land. It was put in place in 2001. So it was the first in the country that prohibited synthetics and mandated an organic approach. Here's a close-up. It's just grass. There are no weeds. Sports. Field hockey. There's that grass chopped right down there. And again, not looking at lots of weed pressures. So sustainable lawn care is doable. It's a non-leachable way. It's protective of our waterways. We're using water insoluble nitrogen as opposed to soluble nitrogen. It is no longer cost prohibitive. You may hear that organic lawn care doesn't work. Well, you see the pictures, it does work. If it's cost prohibitive, you couldn't possibly afford it. We can develop programs now, and a landscaper can offer you a program that's pretty close to the chemical approach. Uh, you know, it, it, it all depends on the expectation. So it's not like there's one organic lawn care program to point to counterpoint the one four-step program, but we manage to expectations. So if you say my expectations are here somewhere, a good landscape contractor or you as a homeowner could come up with an approach that would address that. If we're doing sports or we're doing golf courses, we work on golf courses, high-profile sports. You know, just in the last three weeks, I've been hired by Colby College in Maine, not Holyoke College in Massachusetts. It's just, and it's all high-profile property. I have to do the grass with the president, watch the work every day. The idea, though, that on these situations with high expectations, we develop a program to meet those expectations. It's, it's understanding the protocols, the plant, not just a program of opening bags. And this is the reason I don't think Jay or I woke up, you know, in Jay's case 35 or more years ago. Or we, you know, I was a big chemical applicator. I was in the greenhouse business. I spent 22 years of my life buying, mixing, and spraying more chemicals than you could imagine. And I never solved the problem. I was just constantly doing it until one day I said enough is enough. And I just threw it all away. It cost me $2,000 to get a toxic waste reclamation company to come in and get rid of all my pesticides and dispose of them properly. And I went to all natural strategy. And you know what? In my greenhouse, everything got better. The plants got better. The plants were more durable. We all know in the landscape that insects attack the weakest link out there. And synthetic fertilizers and pesticides ultimately create weak, soft, lush tissue it's an invitation for insect and fungal disease pressure. When you remove the synthetics, you then end up having a, a strong, durable plant that has higher carbohydrate retention. So it, literally the sap that's in those plants, if we want to call it sap or plant juices, insects can't process it because it's too dense with carbohydrates because it's all been managed organically. And the insects go off and they find a neighbor's lawn that is chemically managed where they can process and extract those plant juices. So we didn't just wake up and decide, you know, we're going to do this. We, 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 we really do this for a reason because, you know, like this slide shows, there is an overarching goal. And if you look at the what's happened over the years, uh, we can't go on 50 or 75 years and we can do the same thing. So with that, throw it out for any questions, if anybody has any. Like out, out here with the vendors out here, you saw a lot of organic product. Uh, you might have seen one product out there that said, I saw it on one of the tables, it said kelp meal. Kelp is, is, is works to build stress resistance into grass. Kelp is a potassium source, amongst other things. Potassium in fertilizer strengthens grass, it strengthens thickened cell walls and, and stress resistance. So we precondition with potassium and we start in towards the end of July, 1st of August, and then we take it down little by little so about the 20th. 22nd of August, we deliver it down at playable height. Then bring the mic. I don't know if this is a perception, but the reality is that, you know, I think most people think that you know, the organic treatment process is more costly than the chemical treatment. Is that true? What's driving that? Is it a scaling issue where the, 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 the organics just haven't scaled up and aren't really available? Or what's driving? Well, it, it's, it, it's a couple of things. It's, it's synthetics. I mean, in the, in, in the first bag of four-step program, you're using DDT, uh, you're using 2,4-D. 2,4-D is a 48-year-old chemistry that is dirt cheap. 
So it's out there. Uh, you know, you can go like go out and treat a football field with a with a bottle that's got three herbicides in it. You know, for seventy five dollars. So you know, some of the synthetics in the pesticides are really inexpensive. Some are hugely expensive. So it's all about what they're using. If you have somebody that's using new chemistry in uh, pesticides, you're going to pay a lot of money. But they're not. They're using the cheap stuff that's 45 or 50 years old. So, and that's the stuff that has the hazards associated with it. Most lawn care companies, if they are fertilizing your lawn with synthetic fertilizer, they're giving you four or five fertilizer applications a year, delivering a total of four or five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Organically, you only need three pounds per thousand square feet at the maximum. Most we drop down to two pounds. So you're using less than half of the actual nitrogen. So if you have a bag of synthetic nitrogen over here that costs $25 and treats 15,000 square feet, you might have a bag of organic nitrogen over here that costs $35 and only treats 5,000 square feet. So sure, the cost of this bag is more than the cost of this bag, but you're doing this one four times a year or maybe more. This one you're only doing twice a year. So really, when you do the extended mathematics, there really isn't a big cost. Granted, and, and John will tell you, there's, there's a different cost per bag, but you're not using it in the same way. That one application of organic fertilizer will last for eight to 12 weeks. You saw my slide there that says that the four-step program lasts for four to six weeks. So the extended math, it really isn't that much more expensive. But over time, though, will they scale up the organics and will the price actually decrease? Well, what happens is, yeah, it, it, that's happening as we speak. One of the things that happens if you do organic properly, by the time you get to the three-year point, costs are going to go down. And we've shown this time and time again. For one of the national parks, we reduced costs by 25% after two years because you get things happening. In Marblehead, when we did the first soil test, an acre of topsoil was giving me 75 pounds of nitrogen. Four years later, that same acre was giving me 175 pounds. So that was a dramatic reduction in the fertilizer budget. As organic responds more towards market demand, like anything else, the price is going to come down. Absolutely. In, in compacted soils, it's recommended you do the core aeration in the fall. What would be wrong with me doing it now? Nothing at all. Anytime the grass is actively growing, uh, it's appropriate to do core aeration. Uh, if it's very compacted in the spring, when I go on the site, I tell them aerate right, right away. It's that, it's, that, it's that important. Compaction is the biggest enemy of turf grass. You can take everything else that could happen to turf grass, compaction will hurt it more than anything else. Now, there's some school of thought that says, oh, if you have a lot of crabgrass in the lawn and you pull up a plug in the spring, you're going to put crabgrass seed up there to germinate. So, it will not germinate if you have good turf density. So the idea that if you do a spring aeration, you throw down some grass seed at the same time. You might pull up a little bit of crab grass in year one, but by year two, it'll be all gone. What about treatment on invasive plants? I mean, we have burning bushes that we'd love to get rid of, but we were told that to cut them down in the fall and paint them with Roundup and we hesitate to do that, is there a better way to do it? Yeah, just think about, I mean, that's what I did. I had burning bush that was sold to my parents, you know, back 45 years ago, and we just cut it down and dug it out. Um, that's the answer to everything with invasives. There's all kinds of research that shows that if you do, you know, if you do a five-year study on invasives, and you use Roundup or Rodeo or the cocktail combination, at the end of five years, uh, the mechanical eradication is more effective than chemical eradication because it doesn't, you know, do it in the case of the burning bush, it wouldn't kill it. But it's going to be a pretty it's a toxic way to do it. It's better than a spray by like painting it on there, but it's still going to go end up down there. So I'm, you know, as, 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 as much as it sounds, I'm, I'm very much in favor. And in all my projects, if I'm going to renovate, if I'm going to advise somebody to renovate a lawn, I'm not going to tell them to round up the whole lawn like they do at Cooperative Extension when they teach at the universities, you know, down in Massachusetts in turf, turf school, they teach you if you want to renovate a lawn, you round up the whole lawn, and then you slit seed, new seed into the round up lawn. 
I tell them to go get a sod cutter, I get somebody with a sod cutter and remove it mechanically and start appropriately without dosing 5,000. We're in the National Park, they're gonna give us 20 acres to restore prairie land out in Ohio. And the program on there, 100 acres, and they were gonna round up 100 acres to get rid of weeds. So how crazy is that, 100 acres of roundup? So that's the kind of thing that we're really trying to move away because that's the quick fix, the easy way to do it, but probably not the most appropriate. One more question. Okay. Grubs. How does the organic take care of grubs? Well, John's going to talk about a product that he has. We now have multiple products for grubs. So that's going to be a really easy one. First option we have is a beneficial nematode, uh, a living organism that's found you know, in the soil, but they've isolated a couple of strains that they grow in an insectary. You would buy that, uh, you'd buy that on the first week of anywhere from the first week of August in this region through about uh, the third and fourth week of August. And it comes in uh, these living organisms, microscopic, and you put them in water on the end of the hose and spray them and spray them in. There's another material, cedar oil, uh, essential oil of cedar, a very potent insecticide. You all know what a cedar closet can do. Um, and an, a liquid, a spray application of cedar oil will, uh, will knock out a grub population. Uh, it, you know, John's gonna talk about Elmer Tagware, uh, and they have actually purchased, they're the first, uh, first distributor in the country to purchase cedar oil in quantity and, and make it available in small quantities for the whole world. But uh, very effective, and within two or three years, uh, there will be at least another biological tool uh, that's a granular that will go through a spreader that's in the commercial end of the industry right now and will find its way down to the retail end of the industry. And as that, that concept, is, as market demand requires and requests more of these organic products, these people that are manufacturing it in, in 50 pound bags, you know, and selling it by the pallet, you know, to the commercial industry, will then make it available to the residential or the retail market in small quantities. So good, thank you very much. We have uh, one final speaker. One uh, thing that I neglected to say is that Ginny uh, back does have an email sign up. Uh, and if you are willing to, she's going to pass that clipboard around. And if you're willing to give your email to the Healthy Lawns Thing Water Group and Extra, she would really appreciate it. Appreciate that. Our final speaker is John Boker. And John is works for. Eldridge Lumber and Hardware in York, Maine. The owner, Scott Eldridge, and the company was instrumental in getting the pesticide ordinance that has been mentioned by previous speakers, uh, by the Gunwood, passed two years ago. The company, Eldridge uh, Lumber and Hardware, have made some substantial, rather dramatic changes in their business model. And uh, John is going to talk about what they sell now, what they used to sell, what they don't sell anymore, and uh, indeed how well it's going. John Bogart. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. I, uh, I uh, relish all these, all these uh, opportunities to speak about something that I care about, but quite a lot, and uh, I'm real excited tonight. This is my first PowerPoint presentation, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, I come here tonight with uh, my, my reason for being here is I, uh, I've spent 26 years in the retail lawn and garden business. I started in 1991 after a brief stint in the natural food business, so I, my entire adult life I've been dealing with, uh, with uh, chemical problems in, in, in various ways. And it's, appropriate that I end my career uh, with what I'm doing now. Uh, all but the last three years I, uh, of, of my retail experience I spent with uh, in a conventional uh, garden center. We sold chemicals. A big part of my job was selling chemicals, not actually to promote them, but in, as you know in the retail business, people come in, they want a crop, they want step one. They know it's time to put step one down from Scott's and they come in and they go, where's the step one? Thank you very much, and they're out the door don't have to promote it or not promote it. If people ask my opinion of what they should use, I would always point to the organic fertilizers. 
Uh, my wife and I have always been organic in our own home, and we grow our own vegetables, and, and uh, we enjoy that quite a bit. Uh, working in the business so long, you hardly ever see the springtime. Uh, March, April, May, June, uh, all the plants in, in, in my yard kind of go by without me seeing them. I see them in the morning, and I see them at night, and uh, it's been a little bit of benign neglect in my house, but uh, since I've embarked on, on this, uh, this uh, transition to organic with, with Eldridge, uh, I've paid more attention to my own yard and uh, these techniques that Chip is talking about, utilizing them in my own yard. And I'm here to tell you too that they, that they do work. And uh, it takes time, it takes a little more attachment to uh, a little more reacquaintance with the natural world here in our yards. Uh, too many times our, our, our plan for landscaping is turf that rolls up to the side of the house, a rhododendron and a couple of stelladoro daylilies, and we think we're, you know, we're, we're doing a good job. So what we try to do, uh, I'll back up a little bit. Elders Lumber, we're starting in 2013. Uh, Scott Elder is the owner of Elders Lumber and Hardware in New York, uh, approached me about working for him. Uh, my job at the other, at the other place I'd been for a while uh, was uh, starting to get less and less, and I was headed towards a happy retirement until he dragged me into his plan. His little plan was to, um, he wanted to change the lawn garden uh, section over to more organic uh, products and, and, uh, and techniques. And that was right up my alley, and uh, I, I, took, I took the job on with pleasure. And it's interesting, what set Scott off, what's, what, what set him off to, uh, to, to give up a lot of these chemicals that uh, are a big part of the business, was the uh, knowledge so when he found out that uh, they were spraying 90% uh, of our corn and, uh, and sugar beet and soybean crops with Roundup from the air. Uh, the GM, this is the GMO issue that they always seem to keep under the table is it's being sprayed, it's food being sprayed with Roundup constantly. And uh, this, this incensed him and we've been on a mission ever since to let people know about that. So I, I won't uh, leave tonight without mentioning that at least once. So uh, the first thing we did was to uh, the first thing Scott wanted to do was come up with a mission statement, and uh, I was looking for something quite simple and quite broad that we could deal with. You know, this was early on, this was 2014, uh, and that was simple, to maximize our customers' knowledge of appreciation of organic products and techniques, and to minimize the use of synthetic herbicides and insecticides. Quite simple and quite broad. I, I pictured changing over quite gradually, and uh, things started happening quickly because at the same time as we were doing this, quite independently of what was going on in Gunkwood at the time, um, we, we just happened to be on the same track as Gunkwood. And uh, that's how we met Jay and uh, Beyond Pesticides. And uh, I'll never forget Jay and I walking down the organic aisle that we had, we had, uh, we had done at Elders. And he looked at me and he said, this is national. And I said, what do you mean national? Just because big stores do not give up the chemicals. Um, there's so much money being made in chemicals. They're made cheap, as we were talking about before. They're sold at a high profit margin, and they're sold by the ton. That's why the four steps. They, you, when you turn to organics, the product part of the business just goes way down because you don't need the same amount of products, either in pesticides or in fertilizers. So, uh, with this in mind, the first thing that went was the neonicotinoids. That's spell wrong to do. That should be neonicotinoids. Um, this was the e the easy one for me. Uh, the uh, the controversy was surrounding the, the thing with the bees. This was 2014. By now, uh, it's fairly well understood that there's a sublethal effect of these uh, of these insecticides. But for me, it was very easy to get rid of them because. Um, because the, the answer to a pesticide problem is not to all of a sudden put the pesticide on everything just in case you're going to have a problem in the future sometime. That's what the business is based on, that's what the chemical business is based on. So these, these systemics that they put that are very effective, they go up into the plant, so anything that eats the plant is, uh, is affected, so things that eat the leaves, your roses, are affected, and, uh, but nothing was done for the invertebrates and how they affected the invertebrates, which are feeding on the nectar and the pollen, which also contains the insecticide. Um, they're very uh, persistent in the environment. Uh, that's why they say on some of these bottles, 12-month uh, protection. 
um, and things like that. So anyway, it made sense to get rid of anything that was prophylactic. If you don't have a problem, why use the chemical? And, and, if the, and I'll keep referring back to that mission statement that the whole purpose of this was to get people to use less chemicals. Here's a few of the ones. Bayer is very big in, uh, in neonicotinoids, uh, Bayer crop science. You'll see some of these uh, starts working, uh, kills up for three months, uh, the rose of flower care that people love. These are all products that people were buying and using and having great success with without worrying about the sublethal effects or the effects on the environment. Um, so we immediately took these off the shelf. We didn't even wait to sell them. And uh, I loved it when the salesman came in. My manager, uh, Matt Brock, called me in the office to talk to the Bayer salesman. He was there to sell us the whole package and the, and the setups for the aisles. And we said, don't, you have to go home. It was great. I couldn't believe it. The, uh, um, and I, uh, I immediately wrote, wrote this up so people could see exactly what we're dealing with. I always believe in calling these chemicals what they are. It's imidacloprid. It's not Confidor. It's not Admire. It's not Gaucho. It's imidacloprid. Uh, imidacloprid is probably the largest selling one. You can see it's uh, $1 million, that's in, uh, sorry, $1 billion in, in 2009. The neonicotinoids are the largest selling uh, insecticides in the world. We're very proud to take those off the shelf and, and very happy to do it. And I have about 12 boxes of neonicotinoids uh, all ready to be incinerated somewhere if I can find some way to do it. I'm trying to talk the main board of pesticides into doing it for free. Uh, they tell me about a place in Portland where they do it for $50 a gallon, and we're still working on that. In the meantime, they're in nice, safe plastic, uh, plastic bottles. By the way, you can't send any of these products back to the company. They can send it to you. You cannot repackage and send it back to the companies. They have that figured out. They don't want that uh, problem. Um, so not much else to say about this. Clovianidin, I don't think. Uh, I've, I've read that you can't buy conventional corn seed in the, in the Midwest that hasn't been dosed with clovianidin right from the start. So the seed is coated with this, with this Senate, uh, insecticide, and uh, that is uh, broadcast into the plant as it grows up. So the other problem, uh, we saw a lot of live plants at Eldridge, and uh, we knew there was going to be a problem with uh, you really can't buy plants in the greenhouse industry, especially flowers, uh, that haven't had uh, been dosed with neonicotinoids. It's a very big, uh, it's a very big useful product in the greenhouse business. You have, you have hundreds of greenhouses, uh, acres and acres of space. Now all you have to do with the neonicotinoids is just dose everything through the through the system, through the watering system protected against insect infestations. It's, it's perfect for the industry because it's such a, an artificial environment. So uh, we were very fortunate at Eldridge. A quarter mile down the road from the store, uh, we have a distribution center which also had a one acre turf, uh, turf area. It was an old uh, CMP office building that, that he bought. We immediately put up one greenhouse, and we have two now. We put up one last year and one this year to uh, do our own thing, uh, do our own plants. Uh, uh, organically, uh, not certified, we're not certified organic, but at least these are plants that we grow from seed, which we can be sure of, uh, have not been tainted with anything. Uh, we've got a great uh, organic mix, compost-based mix from uh, Vermont Compost Company in Montpelier, which is doing a great job. The plants are looking great. Those are the seedlings waiting to be transplanted into bigger boxes. But if the sun ever comes out, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeding these fly off the shelf. Um, these are some of the plugs that came from Canada. Uh, I'm a little, I'm a little more confident in Canada. Uh, they have they have some stricter regulations. Uh, some of their importation regulations require that they put some insecticides on plants. But this is from Jolly Farmer out of New Brunswick. Uh, they're a huge operation. They sell the plugs that we put into bigger boxes and grow them on. And uh, they claim they're 85 percent, 85 percent. Uh, without insecticides. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. 85% of the area, 85% of the insect problems, I don't know. But uh, they're using beneficial insects. But I asked them outright if they're still using systemics, and they say uh, it's still a, uh, an option for us. We still use, it. We still use systemics in certain, in certain uh, conditions. So once we got rid of the uh, Took the, uh, the world's largest lead, the leading insecticide off the shelf. The next thing was Roundup. Um, 
and this was before Roundup was declared a, a problem with human carcinogen. This was in 2015, I think. We not only took Roundup off, we also took uh, glyphosate. There are many, many companies that will, that will sell herbicides with uh, the glyphosate as a, as a main ingredient. Roundup is the largest selling one in the world. But those came off the shelf, and uh, we still get people to come in and, uh, and ask for Roundup. I direct them to the organic equivalent. There are several broad spectrum uh, herbicides that, that are certified or are, are, are up to organic standards, and they seem to be working quite well. There's uh, a horticultural vinegar. Um, there's uh, 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 a barnide makes one called Burnout, uh, which is uh, their clove and citric acid based. They, they suck the moisture out of the out of the plants, and uh, it's it's interesting that most people they're so they're not necessarily fans of Roundup. I find talking to customers, it's almost like they've been brought up to you know that when the weeds start, they got to go and buy the Roundup. It's like it's like a, a ritual. When you say you don't have any Roundup, the, the first the first question is, well, why not? And uh, the uh, the the answer is that uh, we have alternatives. So there are some alternatives. The other thing I tell people to do uh, when I talk to people and try to convince them to use less chemicals is read the label. Look, uh, uh, Jay, Jay touched on this. The labels are fascinating. They're, they're slightly different too. They're worded differently. Some of them you're supposed to wash your hands before you go to the bathroom. Some of them you're supposed to wash your clothes after using. Uh, some of them say, uh, there's a, I forget which one it was, I think it was a weedy feed, the 2,4-D, that says that uh, you should put it on at least 24 hours before it's going to rain so it doesn't get washed away or the wind doesn't blow it away. And you look at all the regulations on the back here and you realize that, first of all, nobody's reading it because it's, because it's so small. And, uh, and second of all, if you, did, if you did read it, you'd never buy the product. And, and if I can get people to read it or read it to them, chances are they, they realize there's a problem. These aren't, most of the customers that we have that are changing over are not, they're not sold on these products necessarily. It's just a, it's a force of habit. So we bring it in a little closer, and uh, this one happens to be trifluralin, better known as green. Uh, turf builder. Uh, also, the other thing you learn from the label is how little of these chemicals can be spread over 5,000 square feet and still be deadly to whatever they're after. I think I, I, think I found a 15,000 square foot bag of Scots that contains six ounces of the chemical. So six ounces spread over 15,000 square feet. So you, uh, that's the kind of deadly chemicals we're dealing with. So anyway, we moved all the, uh, all the organic products into one section, the big section right around the corner here. This is aisle 18. This is the end cap with a few organic products. And as you go around the corner, the first section you come to is the living soil, where we talk about uh, compost and organic matter and feeding it always comes back to the microbes. Any of these conversations about planting and organic technique comes back to the microbes. Here's, uh, here's the organic fertilizers. Uh, at least this, there's probably 12 feet there. As you go down into aisle 25, the, we, had, we still have a few chemicals back in there, but it's down to about four feet or so. And I'd like to say that the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive to all of this. People, people that know about organics and are happy with it come into aisle 18 and Think they were in heaven. Everywhere they turn, there's products that they can use. There's products that they know and recognize. And uh, and for people that are in transition, many people, there are some people that just will not. They're, they're set in their ways. They need their roundup. They need their step one, two, three, and four. But there's a whole set of people in the middle that are used to buying those chemical products, but understand are beginning to understand that there's a problem. As you step outside, these are organic lawn fertilizers. These are all organic all the way down. It looks like a display of chemicals there, but uh, this down here, ProGrow, on, on the left-hand side is from North Country Organics. I think it's one of the finest uh, uh, organic fertilizers there is probably on the planet. And I have no trouble, uh, if somebody wants to make a transition without doing a soil test or anything else, I have no trouble selling them the ProGrow. I know they're going to get some positive results from it. And they also make uh, various other concoctions. Avenger, here's, here's, one of the, uh, here's one of the alternatives to Roundup. This is a, a wide spectrum uh, herbicide. And there's the OMRI insignia, insignia, Organic Materials Research Institute. We try to make sure that everything in aisle 18 is, uh, is 
is certified by somebody. OMRI isn't the only certification agent. There are others. Uh, MOFCA does some of it, and there, there, are some, there are other agencies that do it too, but OMRI is the most, uh, the most famous one, that, and they, I suppose they promoted themselves the most. There's a grub killer. This is neem oil from Safer. Uh, Chip mentioned there's also red cedar oil for grubs. But the situation we're running into, again, is this prophylactic. People are so fearful of grubs that they uh, come in for their grub eggs that they, that they know that they've been told has to be put down or they're, they're going to lose their lawns to the grubs. It's very hard to break people of that habit to treat only the areas. When you have a grub infestation, it doesn't hit the entire lawn. It hits in, it hits in sections where they lay their eggs. And we try to keep uh, some information on hand about the biggest problems for people, which is grubs, organic controlled grubs, know about the life cycle of the grub, know where she likes to lay her eggs. She likes to lay her eggs in short grass. She likes to lay her eggs in wet grass. The first thing I tell people, if they have an irrigation system, when they see the Japanese beetles flying, turn off the irrigation system. Let the grass grow a little longer, and that eliminates a lot of it. That's the systems approach that Chip was talking about on a very, on a very uh, elementary level. Beneficial insects, we sell, uh, we sell, we sell those. This is, this is tough for people to deal with a lot of times because it has to be, it has to be applied the right way and uh, um, it has to be cried during the right weather and things like that. But we have the great manises and uh, drug control products. Again, it all comes down to healthy soil. Uh, the soil microorganisms are, uh, are very important. And uh, I brought along this slide. You can, find, you can find these pictures all over the internet. But in one handful of soil, there's some things here that can boggle your mind. But the one that stands out to me is the fungi down in the middle, uh, the middle on the bottom. 50 kilometers of filaments if you line them up end to end in one handful of soil. I can't even conceive that, that number. Uh, down on the left, 100 billion would be uh, bacteria, 10,000 species, different species of bacteria. This life in the soil has been going on for as long as there have been plants on the earth, about 450 million years. And we've been using chemicals for three generations now. And I just look at people and say, what do you want to do? Do you want to work with that or do you want to work against that? And it, uh, it's a very effective way to get people to use less chemicals. I'll, I'll zip along here. I'm late. Um, uh, different, we, we, put, we bag some of our own fertilizers here. The bone char on the left is a very good source of quick phosphate. Uh, Menifee humates on the right is a, is a good, that's a soil microbe feeder. There's a lot of these things that, that, that feed the soil directly, feed the microbes in the soil, just perk them up and make them multiply faster. We already talked about the clover, the crabgrass, uh, uh, chip, chip got into that. It's a warm season grass, so in the middle of the summer, when our grass is going dormant, that's when everybody sees the crabgrass. The crabgrass has already germinated in your lawn, it's sitting there right now. And the idea with organic practices is to make sure that it doesn't go any further than the size it is right now. And that's, that's the secret. It's not, it's not going away. And that's the myth of chemicals, too, is that these things can be controlled 100%. And then I chose this picture because uh, uh, one of the things that happens a lot of times is people come in and they want to change over to organic methods in their lawns. And I say, how many square feet do you have? And they go, oh, I don't know, 55,000. You know, it's some amazing amount. And the first thing I tell them is, why don't you get it down to the amount of grass you can do with a push mower? And then, then we'll find, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do some diverse plantings for the rest of the place. We'll do a meadow or we'll plant some trees. And that brings me down to uh, also, uh, I know this is quick, but uh, I have a sheet out there on the first table. Uh, two things. Uh, some of my favorite websites are there where, where, where I gathered this information. Um, that's one sheet, and the other sheet is uh, native plants uh, available from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Um, anytime we do buffers or we want, we want to eliminate some of this turf, we want native plants. Native plants encourage native insects, a greater diet, biodiversity, and a greater balance in the, in the whole natural process. So that's basically my spiel, and uh, I want to take any questions if anybody has anything. Thank you very much, John. We're going to take just a couple questions. I will tell you that all three speakers will still be here for a bit afterwards, so if there's other questions, certainly engage them and, and, and get the information you need. I just wondering what you recommend to fill for 
Poison ivy. Poison ivy. I would, uh, I would use that horticultural vinegar, 20%. Um, assuming that we want to put a product on it, okay? Because there's another way of uh, doing poison ivy too, which I've, which I've done often. Um, again, I talk, I talk about getting up close and personal with nature a little bit. And what I do is I put on a pair of rubber gloves, I put on a long sleeve shirt and, and long pants, and I tear it out by the roots. First of all, I love tearing things out by the roots because it, you know, it, it solves the problem instantly and, and it makes the area kind of look clean too. Um, now, I don't do this any longer than half an hour and I'm inside and put the, put the clothes in the washer and go take a shower. But, uh, do I have patches of poison on me on my, on my yard? Yes, I do. I have patches. When, when they start to get in a situation where they're going to rub up against my ankles, then they get, they get yanked out. However, if you want to spray something, they're actively growing a couple of sprays of that uh, horticultural vinegar. It's a 20% vinegar. Dangerous to get in your eyes or on your hands. It's, that's four times stronger than regular vinegar, but it works pretty well. You have to do it several times. Is there another question for John? There being none. John, thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you as well as the speakers. Uh, for spending the time tonight. A great deal of information has been thrown at all of you. Uh, we're going to suspend the multiple choice test tonight so that we'll be on the theme without having passed that. But uh, I hope that what you've heard you can put into action and that what you've heard you can pass on to a neighbor and tell somebody else about some changes that we all need to make in the way we treat our turf, our, our lawns, there's a lot of work that can be done, you know, within your, within your towns. You can change the way you take care of your playing fields, your cemeteries, and anything else that's publicly owned. And you can make those changes on your own personal front yards and backyards. So, again, thank you very much for your time. There's a lot more information still out there on the table. Don't forget, RJ's, clean that table off so we don't have to. Anything that's on there, you take it. Uh, Thank you again for your time.